The race to 5G is on, and the battle for talent is getting fierce. Welcome to 5G Talent Talk with Carrie Charles, a podcast dedicated to helping you face the future workforce head on. Navigate this challenging talent landscape with innovative strategies to attract, retain, and engage people in this new world of work, only here on 5G Talent Talk with Carrie Charles, CEO of Broadstaff Talent Solutions. Hi, I'm Carrie Charles, and thank you so much for joining me today on 5G Talent Talk. I am super excited to have with me Tom Kane. He is the president of Network Building and Consulting, better known as NBNC. So NBNC is a site development firm serving all major carriers and tower companies in the wireless industry. With over 500 employees, they've been serving the industry for over 30 years. Tom, thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, Carrie. So great to be here with you today. So, Tom, I've heard about your journey a little bit, and I've, I've known you for a bit here, and I, I really would love for you to start by talking about, you know, how did you get to be the president of NBNC? Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm in my uh, 23rd year at NBNC, and it's been my only wireless slash telecommunications job I've had. And uh, when, when I'm asked about my background, I, I like to say it's the timing is everything story, because it really is a timing is everything story. So I started in 97 at NBNC, and it, the company is pretty small then, around 50 people as an entry level site acquisition specialist. That was, that wow. was my job. I think I may have been quite possibly the lowest paid person in the company in 1997. <laughs> And then those, those of you who are out there who are in the industry in that time, and you know, it was kind of the go-go days of PCS, things were happening very rapidly, and things were happening very rapidly at NBNC. And I was very, very fortunate that through a series of events, I got to, I had some project program management experience from previous profession. I was able to utilize that fairly quickly in a, in a new role that opened up in Philadelphia. And then um, site acquisition was booming then, and we really needed a new department and I was my owner our owner at the time asked me to lead that a small group that turned in I was very fortunate to turn into a bigger group as PCS exploded our owner wanted to exit the business in 2000 which he did so I had the uh, great experience of working for a private equity firm and in the early 2000s building towers for ourselves mm -hmm. and running all of operations for those of you who know the industry in kind of 02 and 03, there was a little bit of a downturn. Private equity firm asked me to take over as president during that period of time. So mm -hmm. this is all really fast. And um, I was able to kind of turn the business around a little bit for them during some challenging times. And I leaned on a lot of people then that are still with me today, which that's what I think I'm the most proud of. And, um, and then the private equity firm wanted to exit the business in 07 and I was able to lead a, a management buyout in, in, in 07. That was uh, a great learning experience. And, um, and again, uh, timing is everything. It is, that's an incredible story, Tom. Um, but more, even more than timing, it's walking in to that opportunity and saying yes. Was there a time when you were nervous or like, oh gosh, what am I doing here? But you did it anyway. Um, in 07, I borrowed more money than I ever thought I would borrow in my entire life. And, and uh, for a person of my, my background and where I came from, it was pretty staggering. But I, I believed in the industry. I believed in my team. And, and we had a lot of great opportunities in front of us. And, and I, I think the important thing that happened then, and I still believe it today, we, we benefited by being management. Um, I thought the business was going to do better. Nothing against PE-backed businesses. They're, they, they bring a lot to the table. And we learned a lot from our PE partners at Baird Capital Partners through a number of years. I know I did. I learned a ton. But I really felt the business it would benefit. It's a kind of a long-term business, our play. And we, we wanted a, a very, very long-term focus that we could then employ for ourselves in 07. Wow. Well, tell me more about uh, NBNC. Uh, what's your role in 5G? And tell me some great things about it. I, I already know, but I want you to tell our listeners. 
Well, in, in 07, back, going back, and it's a number of years now, but it, there's a story there. I and mean, we believed, we were really, at that point, a site acquisition construction management company focusing on, on mid-Atlantic. Um, we saw a lot of opportunity. We added our own construction services and technical services fairly early on uh, in, in, in about 09. Uh, we did a lot of geographic expansion up and down the coast and deeper into the country to, to really cover. We like to sell ourselves as, as a third of the country for a lot of our services. We have in the past few years have a lot, have other services that were even going deeper into the United States. We've opened up, uh, so now we have eight specific offices slash warehouses. Mm -hmm. We also bought a small engineering firm so that we could do our own civil structural mm -hmm. fiber engineering. And, and it's just been a great, great 13 years. Uh, you know, now, you know, my, my dad, my dad joke is I've done every G, right? <laughs> the, the old guy in the room. Um, okay. And, and, and we are, we are really excited about the, the opportunity of 5G as we sit here in 2020. So I think that will, you know, delving into that, what that means for the industry, what that means for NBNC, and then what that means relative to our conversation today about workforce is that it, it is, it has been said by people, a lot of people in the industry smarter than me. So I'll, I'll follow on their footsteps that it, it is the hardest G. Uh, there's no doubt about it. All the G's have been hard and complicated. It's a complicated business, but this one brings an entirely new level of complexity to, to, to the equation. Uh, we have to, as, as you know, we have to modify every cell site that exists for every carrier. Um, so that needs to occur on top of moving and developing a tremendous amount of new uh, wireless assets into a new infrastructure, the, the right of way, the street level, uh, lower, closer for, for, for the propagation signals we need for millimeter wave and others. Um, everything we all know is really happening right now. And, and you know, what we see relative to workforce is we're, we're asking for a lot of new things now. Okay, so we're asking the whole entire industry and MBC and our customers are asking us for a lot of new things, including our opinion is a lot more creative thinking and problem solving. Because in the right of way, there is no cookie cutter. There's no pure roadmap. You go from uh, an area in North Carolina that a carrier asks us to work in to an area in mm -hmm. greater Philadelphia to a rural area in New England, and we have some stuff out in the Ohio Valley, et cetera. Every single one of those small cell projects we have has a completely different roadmap. The utility handles it differently. The Department of Transportation handles it differently. The Zoning and mm -hmm. Permitting Department handles it differently. And so we're in those really early, I call it, you know, I think, I think my friend Mark Ganzi calls it the first inning, you know. I think it's, you know, we're in the first, second inning. Maybe, maybe we just finished the first inning somewhere around <laughs> here. Uh, and you, you, know all the, you know all the stats and our, our listeners, you know, your listeners know all the stats. We have probably somewhere around, you know, 700,000 to a million small cells we need to develop. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what we see about 5G that makes us so excited. The volume, the complexity, uh, the carrier needs, the consumer needs. For me, I'm also very excited about uh, the new uses of 5G that we're going to start seeing as people that are on the front lines. What's coming, uh, you know, the conferences you and I go to and we see each other at. We have a lot of cool panels that come up and talk about, you know, uh, telemedicine, you know, gaming, uh, you know, 4K video, uh, public safety, uh, traffic control, uh, et cetera. And, and really those conversations also then take you to, well, what's that killer app? And no one knows yet. You know, no one knows the Uber. Uh, it's gonna be something really cool, I'm convinced. It's gonna be something that brings a tremendous amount of information together in a very short period of time on a mobile device for a human decision that will then lead to an AI decision. That's, that's some, there's someone really, really smart out there uh, working on that today. So, so that, that's, that's what we're excited about with 5G. Uh, we do a ton of fiber engineering, ton of fiber engineering, as you know. 
small cells, uh, entire, entire ecosystem, the 5G demands are, are, are fantastic. Right. So uh, we're working for every carrier. Uh, we're excited about okay. the new T-Mobile. And, and another layer of complexity, let me throw one more thing out there. We're excited about uh, you know, the new um, facility space entrant in DISH. Mm -hmm. So I remember going back to those early days of PCS launch markets. They're fun, they're different, they're challenging. Industry needs to launch a new carrier. It hasn't been done nationally. It hasn't been done in a very, very long time. And it, that too brings a whole nother level. It's not modifying a site from 3G or 4G and doing you know, a small level, level of macros for a carrier. It's a whole different game, whole different level of talent, whole different mindset that we need and I know a lot of my friends in the industry are talking about as well for the for 5G. Yes, and you um, you talked about talent. Let's move into that a little bit. There was a recent interview in a WIA article where you were featured how infrastructure companies are addressing the 5G skills gap. So what are your thoughts on this 5G skills gap? What is it? What skills are in high demand? What What's scarce? I will say I was honored recently, I think probably about a year and a half ago, to help our association, WIA, and was, was asked to chair a workforce development committee that reports to Jonathan Adelstein, his team, and, and up to the board about these topics broadly throughout the industry, throughout many different types of organizations, and, and what we can all do as an industry and an association to get in front of that. So I've been very fortunate to grab a lot of professionals throughout the country in, in very prominent roles in some of the biggest organizations we have in the industry to help, help just the overall industry deal with that. I would say specifically um, at NBNC, so, so there's a lot of commentary and press and, and, and reporting in the industry on you know, the, the tower skills gap. It's real. So we need we need more tower techs. We need better tower techs. I shouldn't say better, uh, better trained tower techs. And, and part of the reason for that is the volume we've mentioned for 5G. The other part of the reason for that is these installs and the modifications of going from 4 to 5G are getting much, much, much more complicated on a site by site basis. Our, our folks, our tower techs, you know, to take a site from 1G to 2G or 2G to 3G, if you went back and looked at those schematics and their plans, they're not easy but they're a lot more cookie cutter than what we're dealing with and what our field folks have to deal with today on these modifications and installs for 5G. So that's one. At NBNC, we've made a, a, a specific, a specific uh, strategy. We've set a specific strategy to address the white collar skills gap that we see also exists because we're, we're, we're predominantly uh, a development firm we do a lot of our own engineering. We do a lot of our own site development work out in the field in very white collar positions, a lot of program management. We're doing a lot of turnkey for our customers so that we're bringing every single skill along the ecosystem together requires a very white collar skills force. And then so when we look at today and the future, it's again, let's go back to what you and I talked about at the start of this conversation is wow, where are we gonna have the critical thinking, the leadership, and the problem solving? Because in addition to all these complexities we talked about on a site basis, to go into the right of way and to deal with all these, there's, there's no cookie cutter, there's no perfect training. I cannot give a program lead a perfect roadmap. There, it doesn't exist today. They have to be fluid, they have to be creative thinkers, they have to be problem solvers, they have to lead their team as such. And in addition to all that happening, we have an environment where the carriers, our carrier customers are under a lot of um, cost challenges. Mm -hmm. So in addition to get a lot deployed, get a, a lot of it deployed fast, we also have to, carriers have to pay attention to their CapEx. We have to answer the CapEx. So we have to figure out ways to be more efficient without, our big thing we talk about, it can't turn into working our people to death, right? It just can't turn into that. Oh, you. You used to do this four years ago. Now do this times 120% for generally the same amount of money. That doesn't feel very good to me as a business leader. It doesn't feel very successful. 
And, and so with all that, so you take all that conversation we, you and I just had. So it started with us realizing this a few years ago, us saying to ourselves, we really need a sophisticated human capital department. So we're really proud of our human capital department. I will say, I'll, I'll, I'll brag, I'll brag a little bit here that I think for a 500 person company in, in our industry, I think we have the best human capital department in the entire country. It's led by Kara Silbert and a lot of other fantastic. She's awesome. I know her well. She does a great job. She makes us look really smart. Yeah. <laughs> she really, <laughs> right. really smart. And, and it's around this conversation. We, we asked her to lead the department and, and our learning and development in this, in this avenue we just talked about in white collar, it, it was pretty basic. Um, it, it had a long way to go. And it's one of those things where kind of when you rip off the Band-Aid, you realize, wow, it's, there's a lot more opportunity than we even thought. And having Kara come in was really starting to have meaningful conversations with employees about just general workforce and bringing that into the executive room was like, wow, we, we really, really, really have a lot to do. And I'm proud to say we started getting in front of it about three, three to four years ago. And so she has set up program management training and project management training initiatives on those teams we just talked about. She has set up and led new business manager training. Again, we have folks now that have to be very astute business managers around CapEx for our customers in addition to production managers. Conlon McCarthy, again, one of our absolutely top professionals in our organization, makes us such a great organization. He says it well. Years ago, 2G, 3G, maybe even 4G, you take your carrier customer schedule, you deploy on that schedule, and you're successful. Nowadays, you have to do that, but our, our frontline professionals also have to pay a lot of attention to costs, a lot more attention to costs than they had to in 2G and 3G. We've got to answer that challenge. We need to train them. That business manager training is doing that. Um, CARE has done a lot of other cool things as well. We have also, within that project management group, um, there's a really cool book club. And it's a little story I like to tell about how different perspectives can really help um, lead you down a better path. Uh, the team, Kara and her team, picked a great book by Brene Brown, Dare to Lead, um, which, which really spoke to, our, to current topics around empathy, vulnerability, and, and, and being great managers. I love and, that and book. It, and it right. really, and, and you know, here's, here's the honest assessment. I'll be honest about this. I would have picked that book. <laughs> right. I, I just, it's just, I, you know, I, 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 and not that it's not a great book. It's just, it's different people brought in new perspectives into our training that really resonated and our employees that were in that uh, uh, program management uh, track. They loved that book. They thought it just did so much for them by way of, you know, um, it talks about, you know, daring leadership. You know, I think that's, that's one of Brene's quotes in the book. And, and it really resonates with our mission and our brand. And so that was huge. The other last piece I'd add to the puzzle there, and it's a compliment back to our association at WIA. Right when CARE was starting to put a lot of this together about three years ago is when WIA came out with the Telecommunications Education Center. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's acronym is TEC. We're, we're huge fans now and I have to give them a compliment because it's so fit into our what we needed to do and, and in just about two and a half years we've moved 55 percent of our employees through one module or another. It's you know a lot of these modules are put together by my friend Rick and Thacker who does a lot of consulting mm -hmm. work at WIA. I was I will admit I was a little skeptical at first. We have tried in the past to do some of our own in-house training. It had not gone well, probably okay. because I tried to do it myself. And, <laughs> and it, really, it really hadn't gone great. And, and okay. Kara really wanted to do it. So I've been in a lot of conversations with TEC. Let's give it a shot. It has been fantastic. It has been a game changer for us. It has answered the call of what our employees want to get ready for. They have, we've used their 5G training modules, small cell training modules, macro training modules, and wow. uh, uh, they have a wireless 101, which is great for some of our newer to wireless folks that we're bringing up through the organization. So the TEC part of that, again, I wanna compliment that organization and what they've accomplished 
and, and it has been very, very meaningful for, for NBNC. So you talked a bit about the NBNC mission and culture. Let's dig into that a little bit. Tell me more and any other programs that you have to um, attract and retain talent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, 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 you learn a lot from going from 200 people to 300 people to, to 500 people and, and growing. And, and we want to keep growing. Um, uh, you know, a good steady growth pace, pace for us has been, has been excellent. And we want to keep doing that to give, mostly to give our employees continued opportunity for growth in their own professions. So, you know, let's go back to 07 a little bit in this conversation. Again, we, we liked back then thinking about becoming management owned, and we did. And part of that is back then the entire executive committee came from the field. So we knew exactly what it was like to do the job we were talking about. Now, my current workforce will remind me, it's been a long time since I've been in the field, and that's <laughs> So, um, and, but we a lot of our executives that are still with us today um, have, have field background, uh, started in the field in their background. We've certainly added other professionals to our executive team in the past 10 years that didn't come from that, but it really, became the start of our culture that we've continued to refine over the last 13 years, which is, it's, it's, a, it's a company, as my friend Conlon says, we don't make anything, we don't have any antennas, uh, we don't have a software gadget for 5G, that's our uh, biggest value or some special IP, it, it, it is truly our people. And so we believe that and know that today, just like we knew that in 05, 06, 07, and 010. And so we have to continue to walk it like we talk it and make it an employee focused organization. So our culture is one where we continue each year to focus on employees, employee focus. So that starts with, uh, we wanna be a destination employer, okay? Uh, we want to continue to support, promote, and figure out systems that are about teamwork. Uh, you know, one of the cool things we did in our human capital department did a few years ago is they said, hey Tom, we have a lot of recognition around performance to the customer. Customer is really happy and somebody gets recognized. We have a lot of uh, recognition around P&L, we're a for-profit organization. And so we want to recognize astute and, 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 and solid P&L. We talk about teamwork a lot. So what, let's do something about it. They developed the Totally Committed Award. Totally Committed is our tagline and once a quarter, someone in the organization out of 500 people is selected as being the person that promotes teamwork the best through their actions, nominated by uh, the folks on their teams. And, and many times we, we encourage teamwork within a team. We also wanna see folks branching out. Someone in this division needs help, someone in that division needs help. I'm going to do that because there are no silos at MBNC. So we want that teamwork to be a part of our culture. Other important facets of our culture are the fact that it's very competitive out there. Uh, there's a lot of people that want the services and, and offer the services at a very high level that we offer. Uh, again, to continue that growth, to be a great place for people to work, we want to be number one. So that's the thing we talk about. We talk about the fact that if you're on a given project, you're doing fiber design, you're doing site construction, you're doing site acquisition, you're doing structural engineering, I mean, any one of our services, or one of those projects where those services are coming together as a turnkey, be the best. Be the best number one vendor your customer can pick month in, month out, quarter over quarter. And we need to be honest with ourselves. We have big egos, like many folks in the industry, because we're very, we think we're very good at what we do, but we've got to look in the mirror and be like, well, in this project, you know, we, we've got room for improvement. We're not number one. What are we going to do to get to that top spot. That's what we want our professionals thinking about. Then as you accomplish those things relative to culture, talk a lot about recognition appreciation. We do a lot of great appreciation events, things like the Totally Committed Award, things like quarterly recognitions. Uh, we're really proud of our employee events that we put together. This has been a bad year uh, for our employee events. They usually involve getting together at- I've been know, to your Christmas party. 
we've been to the fantastic holiday, holiday parties, yes. Parties, <laughs> and we love those, and we spend, uh, I don't mind it was telling awesome. you, a nice, you know, nice uh, reinvestment or, or a reward to our folks who have done a great job. We go to Major League Baseball in the summer. It's been a, it's been a hard year. I miss, I miss that. Okay. I think all of us miss that. We miss, we had to skip all of our spring appreciation events. We had to skip all of our summer appreciation events. And we have to think about our fall and it's probably not going to be what we want it to be. And we just can't wait to get back to that. So back to culture, that becomes an important part of supporting our culture. And then the last thing I would say is we've worked really hard on communication and transparency. And we've realized how much as we've done more and more of that, our folks and our culture and our, that want to support that NDNC brand, they want that, they want that information. They want even more information, and that would be my advice out there to other talent professionals and, and leadership. I think I've come to realize in the last 18 months, they want even more information than I thought they wanted because right. um, they love the company, and, and how can you not get behind that? You know, I think that you have one of the most highly engaged companies in, in telecom, and I want to know how you do that. One thing you had mentioned to me a while back is that you, uh, you or your team put together an employee engagement survey. Uh, let's talk about that, because that's huge. Employee engagement is usually very low. It, it was really cool. Uh, you know, again, you know, I think that I always want to be surrounded by the, the best and the brightest in the industry and in, in current roles. That's, that's who I want to work with. Uh, and, and we work really hard to do that, find that and retain that. Not long ago, this is probably going on about a year and a half, maybe two years. Again, going back to my, our very high level astute human capital department, they came into you know, a review and said, we want to do an employee engagement survey. I was reluctant. I actually can't remember why at this point because it's been so great. But I remember, because <laughs> I'm not going to exaggerate, and like I just you know checked the box and said you know roll, let's do this. Okay. I wanted to learn more about it. I was a bit skeptical, and it has been amazing uh, for me. I think for the organization, and I have learned so much in. Uh, my human capital department, bringing in some outside resources, running a fantastic engagement survey that was really tailored to our workforce. And I was very proud of the results at the end of last year. They were very good. We have at NBNC, as you said, Carrie, uh, we had some very, very, very high numbers, which yeah. was great. But those who know me know that I just immediately focused on the lower numbers. Right. <laughs> and right. I, I get, you know, I, I guess that's my role, and I'm happy to say that is my role. And, I, you know, people over the last period of time, as we've digested these numbers and had multiple meetings about these, the different scores, have reminded me, hey, Tom, don't forget this score over here and this score over here is you're really drilling into something that's lower than you would like it to see. So the, the very, exciting things we've done is taking all that information we presented it all of it back to our employees through mm -hmm. a series of uh, town hall meetings in the fall showed them exactly the the good and 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 the areas of improvement uh, showed them a, a lot of the survey asked for commentary we showed good commentary and, and and some of the negative comments this is stuff we are taking to heart that we need to be pay attention to and be better at Again, our human capital then established, I, you know, we, we felt like we needed a people to take that information and more lead us to what we need to do instead of me sitting in an office looking at all of the data and saying, well, here's our strategy around this. We, we felt like it's better to take all that information, break it up into, we, we uh, human capital created five advisory groups. And so, and those are, Every exact advisor group has a has a different, all different types of people from throughout the organization because we wanted all those perspectives. And so the feedback from them is what we should do within in, this information has been fantastic. We've already addressed some of it. Some of it we still have work to do. And really what I heard uh, the most was, let's go back to some of our themes 
in our podcast today. Yeah. Transparency, transparency. Mm -hmm. So we are very transparent to our, to our workforce and what's going on. They wanted even more information. They wanted more about how does the company work? How do our projects work? How are we successful? So we really had to take that to heart, training. So we've done a lot, but we definitely, through hearing from our employees, we learned even more about what we could do on training, collaboration and teamwork. Again, we're doing well, but we found some blind spots, right? And, and I, I found some blind spots and some things I had set up as the CEO relative to reporting, relative to business metrics that didn't necessarily support teamwork. It was pretty glaring back to me, like you're, you're, you're actually time supporting competition. Mm, wow. A big, big red flag for the CEO, like let's figure out a way to redo that. So again, we can walk the walk and say, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be the guy that's saying teamwork, teamwork, teamwork and I'm setting up systems that really support inner department competition versus, versus mm -hmm. teamwork. So the engagement survey has been, as you can tell from my kind of couple minute commentary here, uh, it's been just, you know, I've loved every bit of it, all the information I've received. It, it's been huge for us in our development as an organization, and again, takes us back to, well, how do you have that strong culture? Uh, right. Better listen to our employees, make sure we're doing everything to keep them engaged, and make sure we're pivoting where we need to pivot, make sure we're finding blind spots where blind spots exist that we don't know about mm -hmm. to, again, support that culture and support that brand uh, because we want to we keep growing. And, and, and as you know and have seen, you know, 200 people's one challenge, 400 people's another challenge, you know, and as we start pressing six, 700 people, some of those uh, culture and brand initiatives, you, you really need to stay laser focused on. You know, you said, listen, and Tom, that that's a message, a common theme that I've heard throughout this, this entire interview, because there's times where you said, gosh, I, I really didn't know, or I, you know, I didn't know about it, but I, but I listened to it and I was a yes. And many companies, they don't give their employees a voice and they don't listen, or they might listen or pretend to listen. And then they go on and, and do what they want, make their own decisions. That is key, especially with the millennial generation, the generations to come, they want a voice. So you are doing that right. And, it, and again, you know, I, I, just echoing your thoughts there. That's, that's the other thing you learn, you know, again, from the 90s to the 2000s and the 10s and now getting into the 20s. It's, you know, I, I don't want to be the professional sitting there talking about the 1G and the 2G days. That's just what we used to, you know. And because, right. you know, I, I, I can be guilty of that at times, you know. And, and so paying attention, it is a new workforce. It's a new generation coming up. And, and we have to pay attention to their needs and their needs are different. And, and again, well said, we just, and, and you know, the, the cool thing, I would say we'll probably do another uh, engagement survey in the not too distant future. Things are so dynamic and we're growing so much. You, you mm -hmm. have to do that again regularly. Right. It doesn't necessarily, as you said, have to be a survey. There's other ways to listen to your workforce, right? Right. Town hall, we do do Q and A uh, every fall with every market in the same vein. But, you know, Q&A in a room full of people has its right. own landmines associated with it. A lot of people don't want to raise their hand, but on an anonymous survey, you know, they'll tell you what you, they really think. They will. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about was career pathing, because this is very important for people, especially now in the past few years. Everyone, uh, many, actually not everyone, but I would say a, a large percentage of people in the staffing world that we hear why they're leaving their job is they don't see a path for development. I don't see a future for myself. And I know that this is something that's important to you at MBNC. So can you talk about your career pathing program? Yes, yeah, so um, we, we again realized not, not long ago, um, you know, probably, probably this goes back about two years, exactly what you have just touched on that modern young professionals, and I should even say young, modern professionals, they want to know their path many times upon accepting a position just then or 
it, even if they don't address that upon recruitment, they're going to probably address that fairly early on. We have a pretty, we have a very thorough, we've always had a very thorough performance appraisal process that's, that's seasonal uh, that we've always done. But then we had to start bringing the, answering the career pathing question. So again, it goes back to, let's go back to some of the things we've talked about. If you want to be a destination employer, you, you've got to show your employee, especially your, your, your A plus employees right. uh, who are looking for more responsibility, who are looking for, for an aggressive path. You really better be able to answer that question and not with just platitudes and, you know, some, some vagaries. They are looking for specificity. They are looking for guidance. They are looking for training along that path and everything that comes with it and honest conversations. And this is the other thing where, so it goes this, you know, a lot of obviously when you have a employee podcast, employee conversation like we're having, so many things just dovetail together, right? So it even goes back to the manager training. We have to train our managers that, you know, when you're doing your appraisal at the end of the year, let's train you on how to have this conversation, right? About pathing. The other thing we had to do, which was a huge initiative for us, very specific job titles, requirements. We had to even create a few things that we were kind of nebulous on so that it was more standardized. Uh, we had to create, uh, you know, again, when you're a 200 person company, you don't necessarily have internal salary ranges that are on paper, you know, right. uh, you don't mm -hmm. necessarily have that, but you know what, when you're 500 people, you, you need to have that. And that way you can have that conversation. And then someone wants to come into either human capital, come to their manager, come to their director and say, I'd really like to talk about the next five years. So here's, and, and again, I feel like we've done a lot of work in two years. We have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And again, that was reflected in the employee engagement survey as well. Again, we, we heard, again, we knew, we knew a lot of this, but then it was reinforced. Like, I really want to know a better answer on how I'm going to get from A to B to C. Um, one of the things we heard and we just changed, again, because the employee engagement survey, people felt like, opportunities were open up in the organization and other departments and they didn't know about it because yeah we just we didn't necessarily put those out internally so that was a quick pivot we could make in human mm. capital to say well of course Excellent. of course if an engineering role opens up in raleigh um the whole organization should see it you know and so uh pathing's critical to engagement employee satisfaction mm -hmm. and um, retaining, again, if, if we really don't want our top pro professionals feeling like to advance, I've got to get my resume out on the street. You know, we, that's, we really want, and again, total, you know, meritocracy here and it's opportunity for all. And we just want to support that and say, if you, you, you can have, any path you want to set here and we'll help you with that. And, and then conversely, once you, you might get to your destination role, we're, we're happy, very happy that we have some professionals and like, I've, I've hit my destination role. Maybe I don't really want to manage, managing people. I don't have to tell you, Carrie comes with <laughs> it, it's whole set. <laughs> you know, I always love talking to those folks in our organization who went from a task specific role that they had to managing people and the, you know, your whole mind opens up to everything that that entails, right? So we have, we have folks that, again, we just, we just want to answer that destination employer challenge for ourselves and for our workforce. And again, just to wrap that up, I would say we're probably halfway where we need to be on career mm -hmm. pathing. We have that much more work wow. to do, I think, in the next 12 to 18 months. That was said brilliantly from a man who went from a side acquisition specialist to president of the company. That must have been your destination role and it could be others in your company right now. So, but I, I'd love to hear just, you're so open and, and you listen. Um, I mean, just a fantastic culture, fantastic vision, mission, everything. Um, where, 
uh, tell me about your plans for hiring for for now for 2020 and beyond yeah so look, look i think that we have a lot of engineering opportunity we are going to need to continue to focus on engineering astute hiring very good hiring we want the best engineers we want this to be a destination location engineering in wireless has all of its own set of challenges to it it's not exactly for many folks the type of engineering they went to engineering school and got a pe for but for others it is so that that's going to be a key part of our hiring another key part of our hiring and again we're trying to meet that challenge something we talked about very early on in this conversation is tower techs still we we want to be destination employer for everyone in our workforce so our tower techs get the same benefits as a pe uh, same benefits as me so there's there's no differentiation we want them to come and stay we're still unfortunately dealing with too, too much turnover in that group we want to we want to answer that challenge through hiring retaining i think some of it does come from hiring um the last point other point i would make and it goes back to the way NBNC is changing and taking on more turnkey work, the way NBNC is being asked to change to answer carrier CapEx questions, it goes back to more project management, program management roles, and br bringing in uh, those roles in, in not only in hiring, like so in, in astute interviewing. Kara Silbert's, again, compliment to her, we do a lot of behavior-based interviewing to try to flush out, you know, if a person's gonna fit in to our culture and the skill sets we need for those specific roles and team leadership and PM and business manager, sometimes that kind of all comes together. Those are very challenging roles in our organization mm -hmm. and we really rely on those for our success. And then, you know, last, lastly, I would say, one of the things we're focused on, like a lot of organizations, and you know, I don't want this to come across as a knee jerk through all the unrest that the country is dealing with because it's it's very palpable out there right now. But we've been really trying to ad address, you know, opportunities for women in our workforce, which our industry has been behind on, and we we're mm -hmm. really trying to address and opportunities okay. for minorities. And and okay. we we have, you know, I'm going to be the first to say we have a lot of work to do still. We're we're making progress, but okay. progress is not done. There's a lot of progress in front of us. We need to continue to push the envelope. We need to figure out better ways for that. I can say I am really proud of our culture that especially over the last 10 years, I think we really support an opportunity for all type of culture. But we've, we've mm -hmm. got to continue to push the envelope on that. I think we have to be a little better on our recruitment around that diversity mm -hmm. and, 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 and women-based roles within the organization because you and I have talked about that before. I've talked about that on okay. industry panels before. And, and I, I will say like other things we're working on in NBC, we still have a lot of work to do, but we're, we're uh, as with a lot of things, we're very committed to it. You know, I, I think every leader in the world right now has a lot of work to do in that area. And I really appreciate you bringing that up because it is such an important, such an important topic that we all need to be more concerned about. It needs to be front and center. Um, Tom, thank you. I can't thank you enough for this just an honest, inspiring conversation. It has just been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, I want to thank you. Uh, I, I was very flattered to be asked. You've had some fantastic speakers this year, starting back. I think you started this in the fall. I admire what you're doing. I, I told you recently when, when we spoke to get ready for this, I can't believe the amount of content you put out. When you, when you announced this in the fall, I was thinking, you know, maybe a podcast a quarter. <laughs> Am I like number 26 or something, yeah, I think? Yeah, yeah. It's an amazing, uh, so I know that the, I don't have to preach to the viewers out there, but if you're picking up this one, go back through the other podcasts. I've learned a lot from your speakers, I've learned a lot from you, and it's needed in the industry right now, not only what you're doing for uh, Talent Talk, but also the great role you play at uh, Broadstaff. Thank you, Tom, thank you so much, that means a lot. Okay. Take care, thank you. Bye-bye.
Thank you for listening to another informative episode of 5G Talent Talk, brought to you by RCR Wireless News, Telecom Careers, and Broadstaff Talent Solutions. As we advance into the future, we promise to bring you the resources you need to navigate this ever-changing landscape of 5G to help you attract, retain, and engage people in this new world of work. To access the show notes or leave a review, visit broadstaffglobal.com. Until next time.